Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Parenting a Baby with Bleeding Disorder, part of the National Hemophilia Foundation's Make Your Move Physical Therapy webinar series. This new series is supported by a cooperative agreement from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Our presenter this evening is Grace Hernandez. Grace Hernandez graduated from the University of Delaware Physical Therapy Program in 1990. She began her career in physical therapy working as an inpatient physical therapist at St. Joseph's Hospital in Orange County and Children's Hospital of Orange County in 1990. The Hemophilia Treatment Center started at the Children's Hospital of Orange County in 1993, and Grace has been the primary physical therapist for the HTC since the inception. She served as the Southern California Regional Representative for Region 9 from 1995 to 2004, and as a physical therapy representative to the Physical Therapy Working Group for NHF from 2001 to 2004. From 2013 to 2016, Grace was the chair of the Physical Therapy Working Group for NHF. In 2014, she was awarded the uh, Physical Therapist Fellowship Grant from NHF for a research project looking at gross motor delays in children with hemophilia. For the past three years, she has been working full-time at the HTC now called the Center for Inherited Blood Disorders, which serves children and adults with all types of inherited blood disorders. Welcome, Grace Hernandez. Thank you. You're welcome. Our program will conclude with a question and answer segment, and there will also be an evaluation after the presentation for participants to complete. Your valuable input will help us better define programs for the future. To ask a question, go to the area in the far lower left of your webinar screen and type your question into the field just to the left of the Send button, which is located in the pod or area labeled Chat. Click the Send button when you have finished typing your question. However, please note that your question will be addressed during the question and answer session at the end of the presentation. The PowerPoint presentation will be available as a handout. However, a recording of this webinar will be available shortly on the National Hemophilia Foundation website, www.hemophilia.org. For more information, be sure to visit www.stepsforliving.hemophilia.org. And without further ado, I will now turn things over to you, Grace. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to thank everybody for joining me this evening as we go over the webinar for our Parenting a Baby with a Bleeding Disorder. Um, I just wanted to say that much of the physical therapy time at the Hemophilia Treatment Center is really focused on bleeding recovery and rehab for muscle and joint bleeds. And we don't typically um, have a lot of um, involvement with kids at this young age. However, as we go through this webinar, you will be able to see how important physical therapy can be for your babies, especially when you first get diagnosed and you're getting familiar with the whole hemophilia concept and what um, things to expect in the future. So as we go through the webinar, um, I hope by the end you'll be familiar with normal motor development for kids from zero to two years old, learn some safety measures for the home to help decrease bleeding risk, and I'm also going to review some of the common bleeds for kids under two years of age, and also some of the physical therapy treatments that can be implemented if they happen to have a bleed at that young of an age. So these are some topics how I'm going to go through the webinar here. We're going to first focus on the motor development, then get into the accidents and injuries, simple treatments, and then discuss safety issues at home and away. And then I also interviewed a bunch of parents of mine who have kids that are, you know, have, are older than zero to two now and have kind of like been through this phase of their child's development to get some tips about what they did 
to help their child decrease some bleeds and also give them some peace of mind as their kids were going through this learning how to um, stand up and walk and all the um, motor development is things that you're going to learn as we talk about it. Um, so the things I want to know is under kind of gross and finer development. These are the um, different I'm going to talk about these different hand like using it and grasping like their body position like in for the visions of different ages and then how you learn different movements and how which one builds on top of each other as the child gets older. Oops, sorry, I went too far ahead. <laughs> okay, so first we're going to talk about just zero to two months age and their motor development. And this is really where little kids are still kind of in reflexive movement. So they're just kind of kicking and punching and wiggling around without any specific purpose. So as far as their fine motor control goes, at the beginning, they're just going to kind of be kicking and moving their legs and arms around without any purpose. But usually by the time two months, you might actually see them extending their arm out towards an object that might be presented to them. Um, they can hold on pretty tight. That's a reflex that babies have and when they're born. So they can grip on really tight to your hand, but they don't really have any purposeful ability to let go of any objects. And uh, then there's two months you might be in for their hands, putting their hands to the mouth and packing on them and things like that. And so there's their body position because they were so tight in um, the womb way they were developing. Their arms and legs are still pretty tight and bent, and their hands still typically pretty tight and bent. And then as they you know, grow and can move around and they have more arm, and you'll see their arms and legs will start to relax and stretch out a little more. But in sitting, they don't really have any head and trunk strength just yet, so they're going to need total support and they're going to be all flexed forward. When they're on their back or their stomach, they should be able to turn their head a little bit to the side. That's just normal reflex, especially with these hanging out, so that they can clear their airway and not um, have their head with their face flat down on the mattress surface. If they are um, on their side, they may accidentally roll on their back, but it's not really purposeful. And then they can also things are important in stepping to what's going to come oh, as sorry they to interrupt, over. Grace. I'm sorry uh -huh. to interrupt. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. Grace, are you on a headset or are you on a handset today? I'm on a handset telephone. Okay, because it was just cutting out, and then there was like a loud sort of beeping noise. Um, okay. Uh, Is it? Maybe your computer speakers, if they're turned on, maybe you can just mute them. We just want to try and avoid any sort of background noise. It was a very okay. Yeah. So if you could do that, and then we'll. Is that better now? I turn my speaker phone thing off. Does this okay. sound more clear? Yes, much better. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to go on to three to four months development. So this is when the kids are really going to get a little better at lifting their head up and being a little more purposeful playing with toys. So now they're going to actually reach towards a toy more purposefully. They'll actually hold on to it with more purpose instead of just a reflex. But they still might even see them start to bring it to their mouth. And if you're feeding them with a bottle, they might start to pat the bottle with their hands. For um, gross motor development, now that I do call it like baby tummy planks because now the kids will actually by four months be able to start to push up on their elbows and kind of hold themselves up. And then on, when they're on their back, the baby reverse crunches. That's just like little baby sit-ups. So now they're going to start lifting their legs up so that their knees come up and they're able to reach up and touch their knees. So we just call those little reverse crunches if anybody goes to the gym and works out. This is how babies get their exercise at this young age. And then in sitting, their head and back will start to be more upright, but they still need total support. When you hold them up in standing, if their feet are touching a surface, they might start to push down into the surface, but they can't really stand at this age. Now when they are lying on their back, they might actually be able to roll over to their side 
um, but this is still done like accidentally. And when they're lying down on their back, this pull to sit, if you hold onto their arms and pull them up from a lying down position up to a sitting position, at first their head's going to fall kind of behind their body motion because their neck muscles are weak. But as they get older, closer to four months, they should be able to align their head with their body. Between five and six months is typically when we see kids be able to sit better and eventually sit independently and start doing some more purposeful rolling. As far as reaching, now when they're on their tummy, they'll actually be able to lean onto one hand, lean and kind of reach out with one hand while they're on their stomach. When they're on their back, they're going to reach up with both hands for toys that might be dangling from a floor play mat. In sitting, they can start to balance and start reaching out for toys even in a sitting position. With their hand position, now their hand's going to be more open and not able to bang the surface. They can even transfer, like take one toy and put it into another one. They might even start holding the bottle if they're being bottle fed and they can hold the bottle by themselves. And they might start to use their fingers to rake up like little pieces of Cheerios or other kind of small foods you might be feeding them. Um, when they're uh, sitting, or, oh, sorry, I'm going to start. When they're lying on their back, now the baby will actually lift their knees up and their feet, and they can reach up and touch their feet, and they might even lift their head up off of the surface, so they're kind of doing little baby crunches. When they're lying down on their tummy, they can push up onto straight arms, so it's almost like doing a tummy push-up. And then in sitting, this is when they eventually will learn how to sit unsupported, but at first they're going to use their arms to kind of prop forward to hold themselves up in sitting. When they're standing, if you're holding them up, supporting them, they'll actually put their feet on the surface and bounce up and down, and I call them saying the baby squats. As far as moving those, now they should be able to roll from their back to their tummy so they can start rolling it, uh, across the floor and moving a little more than just accidentally rolling from one position to the other. If in sitting, when they lose their balance by the time they're six months, they should be able to put their hands forward to catch themselves from falling. And this is an important protective reaction that you want the kids to be able to do because it's something they need to maintain and keep using when they learn how to stand and all that stuff to protect their head from any hitting anything when they fall as they get older. When they're lying down and you pull them up to a sitting position with their arms, they're able to lift their head up uh, in front of the motion so their neck muscles are getting a lot stronger at this stage. So I'm just going to kind of look at bleed prevention precautions now that we talked to the, the zero to six month age, which is really focused on them learn to get better head and trunk and muscle and start and roll. So they're not really moving around the house at this time. Now, some kids obviously will be faster with their grocery development, and some kids will be slower. So this is just like a general range. It doesn't have to be at these certain ages. So some kids might not be sitting independently at this age, and some of them might already be crawling. So as far as preventing bleeds at this age, we talked about that kids can roll from their side to their back accidentally and then eventually accidentally from their back to their side. So if you, they're on any kind of elevated surface like a changing table, they can roll off at this young of an age at even zero to two, four months. So obviously never leave them alone. If you put them on the bed to change them or anything, make sure everything's close by, everything that you need. And then as far as children with bleeding disorders go, it's kind of recommended that you use soft toys because they don't have really good control of their arms for holding rattles and things like that that you might give them. So they might inadvertently hit themselves in the face or bang their mouth. And so usually it would be a better idea at this stage of their development to use soft toys so they don't get injured. When they're playing on the floor, you want to have them playing on carpet or padded floors so that when they're learning how to pick their heads up, they're not going to bang it back down and hit their mouth on the floor or something like that when they're learning how to lift their head on their stomach or pick their head up when they're playing on their back. At this stage and also as they get older, they like to mouth everything to kind of explore the 
environment and all the things that they're holding and learning about. So I wouldn't have them playing with hard objects at this time because then they could get mouth bleeds if they put them in their mouth. And if you put them as they get older in any of those activity play centers or a playpen, that's a good idea if you need to have them somewhere safe, if you have other kids in the house or dogs or something, that you want them to have a safe place to play and sit on the floor. But they don't recommend using baby walkers, which are rolling mobile devices for them to sit in. Uh, kids are supposed to be in a rear-facing car seat until they're two years of age. There are extra padding Velcro straps that you can get for the car seat straps because sometimes the hard seat straps and the little plastic things can push on the kid, especially if you have a child with severe hemophilia or if they had an inhibitor, they can bruise really easily. So you can get padded car seat straps um, when they are learning how to sit. It might be a good idea to put firm pillows or when my kids were learning how to sit, I used, they have those nursing pillows or the boppy pillows as they call them. You can put them around their back when they're learning how to sit because that will help them sit and also a softer surface for them to land on if they lose their balance. And for children under one year of age, especially at zero to six months, it is recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics to not have any bedding, no padding, and no soft toys in the crib. They really should just have a firm crib surface with a fitted sheet because little babies have a risk of um, suffocating if they, they, uh, at this age. And so just talk to your pediatrician about this because I know parents, if your child's diagnosed with a bleeding disorder, you immediately think you need to put all this extra padding and super soft surfaces and things like that around them when they're sleeping. But just know at this young age, it's not recommended. So now when we get to seven to eight months of motor development, now the kids are usually up and on the move. So you're um, going to have to be running around following them around the house because they're going to get into everything at this stage. So as far as their hand and um, arm control, they're able now to like lean on one hand while they reach out. They can bring toys to their chest. They're starting to shake and bang them more purposefully. They can actually let go of toys better, more on purpose. They might even start using their thumb and index finger to pick up small objects. And they might even start finger feeding themselves at this time. So they're getting a little more better with their finger control, a little more dexterity going on here instead of just grabbing everything with a whole fist. As far as gross motor skills go, their arms and legs should be all relaxed, extended out in any position if they're lying on their back or their stomach. They should be able to stretch their arms and legs out without any difficulty. Their head and back should be upright and sitting. And if you're still supporting them and standing or they're standing up holding on to something, they should have a nice straight back and head. When they are um, on their back and you hold on to their hands or their arms, they should now be able to pull themselves up so they can kind of do a whole baby sit up without any help from you. Tummy crawling is when the baby's laying on their stomach. They should be able to pull themselves forwards um, using their arms, kind of combat crawling you see in the military when they have to crawl under low like fences and things like that. In sitting, now they should be able to turn sideways to get toys that may be off to the side when they're playing without falling. They can use their hands to stop themselves from falling to the side. So we call this protective extension. So at this stage, the kids should be able to put their hands out in front or to the side to stop themselves from falling over and sitting. They should be able to go from sitting, turn to side sitting, and then eventually rotate onto their hands and knees. Once if they start play, getting up on their hands and knees, they usually will start rocking back and forth, which is kind of the pre thing that they do mobility before they actually start crawling on hands and knees. In standing, if they're sitting on the floor, if you hold onto their hands, they might pull themselves up to standing with your help. And then between nine and 10 months, this is when the kids start getting up and moving and cruising. So, Reaching, they're going to have a much better hand control, manipulating toys, being able to hold little things with two fingers. And then they also start poking with their fingers and holding on to food at this age. As far as movement and mobility, on their back they can get up to sitting without help. When they're on their tummy, they can push up onto all fours. In sitting, they can turn sideways and rotate around without having to put their hand out to support them. 
they at this stage now when they're sitting, if they lose their balance backwards, they should put both their hands out backwards or at least one to catch to stop themselves from falling backwards. They can pull up onto their knees. So if they're on their hands and knees and they get over they crawl over to some furniture, they'll use the couch to pull themselves up onto their knees and eventually into standing. They usually will be hanging out, holding onto furniture, and maybe start taking some side steps at this stage. And if they're standing up holding on to the couch or a chair or something, they usually can lower themselves back down to the floor. And all this stuff is really important for them to learning how to get up and down off the floor in a safe manner to help them learn once they start walking and letting go to be able to get up and down in a more controlled manner to help prevent falling. They also might even start to take some steps without support. So you might see the kids start letting go with the furniture and start walking at this stage. In 11 to 12 months, this is when the kids get usually get ready to go. Walking independently is usually a range between 12 and 15 months, so don't worry if your kid's not walking by 12 months. It doesn't mean that they're behind or anything. At this stage, they're going to point with their index finger. They're pinching and holding toys. They're usually um, able to hold the toy with one hand and open and close it with the other. They can drop little objects into small containers. And you might even see them starting to use their spoon when they're feeding, when you guys are feeding them. As far as gross motor, they can get up on their knees and play. They can stand without support. They might even start playing like rolling and, and holding in a ball when they're sitting down and playing on the floor. They can usually hold on to the couch and reach down to the floor to get a toy and stand back up. They'll start walking short distances without support. And this is when they usually try to start crawling up the stairs if you have stairs in your house. So as far as prevention for bleeds at this age, since they're getting much better at hand control and using their fingers and pulling on things, um, and they are mobile at this stage, you want to make sure that you get cords, tape, things like that out of reach so that they're going to pull anything down on top of them. At this stage, since they're learning how to walk, you want to try to pick up any hard objects that, so they don't step on them or fall onto them on their bottom. You're going to make sure that all the furniture, counter corners, things like that are padded. That's just typical baby proofing stuff they recommend anyway so that kids, when they're learning how to walk and crawl, they don't hit their heads or fall into the furniture. If they're at the couch and you have a coffee table nearby, if they lose their balance, you don't want them to fall into the sharp edge of the coffee table. If you have hardwood floors or tile floors, you might want to have carpeting or you can get those foam play mats in the area where their kids are going to be playing and learning how to sit and those kind of things so that they don't fall down on a hard floor, or um, if they're learning how to crawl, they can get bruising on their knees and stuff if the floors are hard, especially like a tile floor. There is padded clothing you can get or even knee pads to put on the kids when they're learning how to crawl if they tend to get a lot of bruising, but it's not something you have to do. Uh, if you have stairs in your house and they're wood, and they don't have any carpet on them. There is carpet treads that you can get that attach to your stairs if you don't want to re-carpet your whole stairs if the kids are going to be going up and down the stairs a lot. But usually you're going to have gates at the top and the bottom of the stairs and limit how much the kids crawl up and down the stairs. So you, you don't necessarily have to put carpeting on the stairs, but that is just another thing that you can do if they tend to get lots of bleeds. And you can also use the baby gates besides on the stairs to keep them in or out of certain areas in the house. So if you want to keep them in a certain play area and not give them free range to the whole house, you can use the gates to kind of restrict their mobility around the house. The other things at this age, you really need to be right there because they're going to be up and moving and they can go so quick from one place to the other. So you really kind of have to keep your eye on them and be around them, be around them all the time. They're still kind of mouthy and want to stick everything in their, in their mouth, toys and things. So I would still use soft toys or you can get rubber toys that you play with in the bathtub or in the pool or something like that for them to play with. And in the bath, now they're probably going to be out of their little infant bath thing and sitting up in the bath and they have those bath rings they can sit in and make sure you have a rubber soft mat um, for non-slip but also cushiony on the bottom of the tub. 
when they're learning how to sit, you could keep the toys a little closer to them so they don't fall over trying to reach toys that are out of reach so much. And then still at this age, you're still not going to have any extra bedding or padding or toys in the crib. Now when the kids, I'm going to jump a little bigger steps here now, so 12 to 18 months, this is when they're really learning how to walk and try the stairs at this stage. And I'm going to stop talking about the fine motor hand control at this stage and really just focus on the motor movement stuff that the kids are going to be learning at these ages. So this is when you're really going to see the kids start to learn how to stand without help. They should, if you have stairs in your house, they'll be crawling all the way up a flight of stairs. They'll even start walking up and down the stairs one at a time with support, either holding on to you or the railing or the wall. They start to learn how to walk quickly without help. They may even start taking backward steps. They can stand and reach down and pick up a toy in play and stand back up without having to hold on to the furniture anymore. And if um, at this stage, they might try to start kicking a ball in standing or throwing a ball underhand. And then from 19 to 24 months, this is where you're going to get a lot more climbing, running, and jumping going on with the kids at this stage. So, now they're going to, besides crawling up the stairs and walking up the stairs, if you have stairs at home, this is when they start crawling backwards down the stairs, which is kind of a safe way to get down the stairs anyway. So it is a good thing for, to let them and encourage them to learn how to do. They'll also start walking sideways without any support. And the kids might even start walking up the stairs one at a time without support. You'll see them start trying to run. They might even start jump forwards or jumping off a step if you have steps at home. They'll also maybe kick a ball forwards if they have a little ball on the floor and they might be able to kick it instead of just trying to hit it randomly with their foot. They get a little better at throwing the ball overhand and underhand. And also they'll be starting to climb into the furniture or climb up onto a chair or the sofa without any help. So as far as bleed prevention at this stage, you want to make sure when they're learning how to walk, a lot of times you can use, they have sturdy weighted like push toys for the kids when they aren't really independent good at walking just so they can get more walking practice in. They can push the little toy around the house. Or there are uh, actual walking assist harnesses, not the ones that you see people when you're out and about and they have like a little leash on your kid, but they're actually like harnesses to help you so you don't have to lean over so far to hold their hand when they're learning how to walk. And it's also a safer way you know, for kids that might fall down a lot or tend to get bleeds and bruises from falling on the, uh, down on their bottom or falling over that you could use. But you could just talk to your physical therapist about that if you think that's a good idea for your kid. But it's not something you have to use with them. We actually use them in physical therapy quite frequently when we're trying to get kids to learn how to walk so that we don't have to bend over and kill our backs holding up little kids. <laughs> um, other things that you are going to want to be worried about at this stage, even at the younger age when they're crawling and walking, is you know they're going to be wanting to explore the whole house. So you need to make sure that they're supervised when they're walking, running, getting all into everything in the house. They really need to be supervised. Again, you're going to want to pick up any hard objects that they might trip over or fall on. And then at this stage now, over 12 months, once they're one year old, it's okay to add bedding and soft toys to the crib now. But make sure the toys are not big enough for them to use to climb out of the crib or the playpen because sometimes people have like big stuffed animals or something like that and the kids will actually use them as like a little leverage and can use that to climb out of the crib or the playpen. You want to make sure you move chairs away from counters or windows and make sure you push them under the tables because kids will use these to climb up and get onto countertops or tables and things like that which is another fall risk for them. And then when they're playing in outdoor play equipment or at the playground or at the park, you just want to make sure you have your hands on them when they're on the playground equipment because they can still fall really easily. If they let go with their hands. They don't really get the risk of having to hold on all the time. So just make sure you're right there with them. Now we're going to get into a little bit about accidents, injuries, and bleeds. So with the first poll question, if you can just please put your answers in the Q&A section because the polls didn't get uploaded into the webinar. So if you can just 
type in either A, B, C, D, or E for your responses in the Q&A section. So I just want you to pick what you think the leading cause of a non-fatal injury. So this is just an injury that a baby would get hurt, but obviously it's a non-fatal injury in zero to one years of age. All right. They're starting to come in. Looks like we have one, two, three, four. We have four for answer B. Uh huh. Sorry, more than now we're up to about six for B, and then we have two for C. Okay. So the answer is B. So that was, most people know that, which is a good thing. <laughs> and choking is another one, but it's not the most, it's actually not even one of the leading causes for um, non-fatal injuries in young children. So according to the Center for Disease Control reports in 2006, and then there's a new report in 2013 that falls through the number one cause in kids less than one year, and actually it's still the number leading cause of injury for kids one to two years with 43%. And then the next, so more than 50% of injuries in kids, and the main reason they go to the ER is because of falls. And then the next most common is getting struck by or hitting against an object, and then actual animal bites and insect stings are the next leading cause. So the next poll question, same thing, if you can put in the Q&A section, which type of bleed is not one of the top four bleeds in kids less than two years. So out of the five here, which one is not the most common bleed typically reported in this age group? Okay, we have, well, it looks like majority are saying B. Very good. <laughs> Because when your children get older and as they grow up, that's, all, that's most of the talk is about joint bleeds, joint bleed prevention, and joint bleeds. But at this age, that's not really the high risk of bleeding for this age group. So with the UDC data collection that they did, the most common bleeds were those four bleeds, the head injury, oral mouth, soft tissue, and circumcision. And then I just put in, they also noted that heel sticks can be a site too of prolonged bleeding. So when your baby's born and they usually do a blood check for anemia and things like that when they're born, that's one of the ways that people, that the babies tend to get diagnosed is they do a heel stick and it bleeds and bleeds and bleeds. So, but that's not always the case. So these types of bleeds for the circumcision, soft tissue, oral, mouth, head injury, you should always contact your hemophilia treatment center doctor and nurse for any of these type of bleeds for treatment recommendations. And after you, know, you get the diagnosis, you should have done education at the hemophilia treatment center with your doctor and your nurse. So you should already have some kind of treatment plan in place for these type of bleeds. Because physical therapy doesn't typically get involved in any of these bleeds except for maybe some soft tissue bleeds that we'll talk about later. But we're not one of the... Um, main people involved in these type of bleeds, so I don't really have any treatment recommendations, and every treatment center has a little bit different teaching and what to do, so this, I'm just going to defer any kind of treatment recommendations to this to a plan with your doctor and nurse at your hemophilia treatment center. Now, some of the joint and soft tissue bleeds that I have gotten involved with at our clinic for kids this young is some kids have gotten bruises that had turned into bleeds, learning how to crawl or falling onto their knees. Some of them have gotten ankle bleeds when they fall when they're learning how to walk. Their elbows have hit against hard surfaces, whether when throwing a temper tantrum in their car seat or falling over learning how to sit and walk. Some have come in with finger toe bleeds from getting pinched, stepped on, or jammed, or things falling on top of them. Some of the kids have gotten buttock bleeds that actually have gone like tracked down into their scrotum area from falling on a hard object. Like when they were walking, they fell down and sat down on something really hard and it caused a bleed. Some kids have come in with calf bleeds from jumping around. And then also, 
Um, some of the kids have come in with thigh or arm muscle bleeds when they get their vaccinations because they've been given um, intramuscularly. And typically at our center, they recommend that you get vaccinations subcutaneously. So it's just, you know, try to avoid, but you should have a you talk with your doctor and nurse at your hemophilia treatment center and they should have a plan for you for getting vaccinations for your child. As far as um, recognizing a bleed in children this young, it's hard to um, know where they have a bleed and if they have a bleed because they can't verbalize and tell you. So what you need to look for in young children, what we typically talk to with our families is about we've gone through kind of the motor skills that they should be achieving and you kind of know what your child is able to do and not do. So if you see any kind of regression in motor skills like they used to be walking and now all they're doing is crawling all around the house again and you're trying to, that might be a sign maybe their ankle hurts or their foot hurts because they don't want to get up and stand on it. If they stop using one side of their body for play or for mobility, they're playing with a toy that typically they play with two hands and now you see them just leaving one arm by their side and only playing with one hand to play with the toy. Obviously, if one side looks more swollen than the other or has less movement, so typically, you know, with babies and the young toddlers when you're giving them a bath at night, that's a good time to kind of do a quick body joint check to make sure everything looks good. You can bend and straighten their arms and legs and move their feet around and make sure everything looks like it's moving equally and nothing looks swollen compared to the other side. Kids will also not want to stand up or you'll see them limping when they're walking. Some of the kids crawl funny and so the parents have called me and said, oh, the kids are crawling funny. And so what they'll do is instead of crawling with on hands and knees, they'll have one leg stuck out to the side. And that's usually because they have an injury in their knee or their leg, so they don't want to put their knee down on the hard surface. And another one is just if your kid is fussy or crying for no apparent reason, you've ruled out kind of all the other typical reasons your kid would be fussy and crying, and that would be, you know, wet diaper, all the other hungry, tired, and they're just crying and fussy and like really upset and seem like they're in pain, then that would be another reason to contact the center and maybe um, see if they have a bleed. So basic physical therapy treatments, I mean, this is what we tell people that have like joint and muscle bleeds. So at, the, at this young of an age, it's kind of hard to put like a brace or a splint on a little kid because they're not going to keep it on and it, you know, could cause pressure in the area that's having a bleed and they can't tell you if it's uncomfortable or hurting them. So at this time, sometimes we can make little splints for kids at this age, but it's not really typical. So you, if you come into the hemophilia treatment center, you could talk to the therapist and see if they think it would be appropriate for the type of bleed they might be having. Obviously, you want to rest the area, so avoid any activity weight-bearing until the bleed resolves. And you can use ice or cold packs on them, but don't put them directly on the skin. Always wrap them in a thin cloth or paper towel. But typically, babies and toddlers are not going to tolerate something really cold against their skin, especially if it's an area that's already hurting. So don't... Um, don't worry if they won't tolerate the ice. It's not something that's mandatory. It's just kind of like maybe a helpful thing if they will tolerate it. You could add that in to your treatment. As far as compression, use if you were going to put an elastic bandage on a kid this young, you have to really use caution because they can't tell you if it's too tight. And usually they'll just take them right off. So we don't usually put elastic bandages on kids this young, but they have, and it's not recommended to use one that has those metal clips because obviously that's a choking hazard, so you would only use a self-adhering Velcro bandage and with direct supervision. So you want to take them off for any sleep or nap times because they could come off and, you know, you just don't want them to have something in their bed at this age or something that they could use to wrap around, you know, get caught around their neck or something like that. You just, they shouldn't be sleeping with those type of bandages on. And then also, as far as elevating it, it's really, I mean, you're not going to get a kid to lay down on the couch and put their ankle up, but if they do have a bleed, maybe just try to not have their leg, if it's in their ankle, their knee, hanging down as much as possible. Now, as far as safety tips for zero to two years of age, um, we're just going to kind of quick go over some of the things we've already talked about in just general um, recommendations for preventing bleeds in the home. So the biggest threat to a kid's life is an injury, but and since falls are the highest 
injury cause in kids from zero to two years, it is um, a good idea to put some safety measures because most falls are preventable and predictable. So the main three things that the Academy of of pediatrics recommends is supervision, home safety, and playground safety because implementing those three things would help reduce falls and injuries in this young age. So as far as padding, we've already talked about some of the padding things you can do around the house to help prevent getting bleeds or injuries from running into hitting hard surfaces. So some other things is padding the doorknobs, the faucets for the bathing, um, when you're out and about with shopping carts, they do have padded seats that you can put in the shopping cart so they're not going to hit the hard plastic or metal on the shopping carts. Um, and also, you might need to pad your floors. Sometimes padding even the walls in the playroom area, you might want to put pillows up or something like that around the wall if they tend to fall down and hit into the walls. And they're also is special made padded clothing or elbow and knee pads for when they're learning how to crawl. But then, you know, I just remind you not to put extra padding in the crib for kids from zero to one. So this is just a picture of some padded clothing that was developed by this company, Jizzy Bella, and it is available online. It can get a little pricey, but um, as you can see, there is extra padding in the elbow and the knees, and then also the blue striped one has padding on the buttocks area too. And this was developed for, um, for padding, for crawling, and even kids without bleeding disorders, some of the parents are using this type of clothing and stuff just to prevent them from getting bleeding, especially in where we live in Southern California, a lot of the houses have tile and hardwood floors, so even kids without bleeding disorders can get little bruised up knees. And then these are just some other elbow and knee pads that you can order online. But sometimes when you have these type of knee pads and the kids are crawling around, they can slip down a little easy or they can get kind of tight. So you just have to order them in the sizes that would be appropriate for your kid and they might grow out of them pretty quickly and need to order the next size up. And then as far as locking and securing things, obviously this is just general baby safety stuff you should be doing around the heart house regardless if your kid has a bleeding disorder or not. But these are just some of the key points for kids with bleeding disorders is you want to make sure you always use all the safety straps in the car seat, the changing table, the high chair, the infant seat, swing, shopping carts. I can't tell you how many times I'm out and about and little kids are in their stroller and they don't have the straps on them or, you know, if you're, you know, you just think you can stick them in the car seat and they're not going to get out and you don't need to have the straps on, but you should always have the straps on because that's one of the, especially with a high chair and things like that, pe babies can topple out pretty quickly. And then always have gates at the top and the bottom of the stairs and between rooms in your home. You want to have lock guards on all your windows, especially if you have a two-story house. You want to lock all your doors because you don't want the kids to be able to get outside. They'll learn how to open your doors pretty quickly. And then if you have any big heavy furniture or things on top of furniture, they recommend that all your furniture is secured to the wall with the safety straps. Most furniture comes now with the straps that you are supposed to put on the back and attach to the wall. And then also your cabinet doors, you want to have safety straps or locks on them so the kids can't get in them and obviously move anything that would be harmful to them. But also the kids with hemophilia and other bleeding disorders, you don't want them opening and slamming little cabinet doors and drawers and getting finger and hand bleeds that way. So this is, I just thought these pictures were cute because little kids are always getting into everything and I think everything is interesting to them and everything is not out of reach. So the little kid on the right, how he's pushed the chair over so he can get to the stuff on top of the little media cabinet. So just make sure you're always watching them because they're going to be pretty clever at trying to get things that look interesting to them. As far as protecting their little body parts, so you know we talked about earlier never leaving them alone on the changing table, high chair, or any other elevated surface. Never leave them out of reach in the bath or any shopping carts because it's really easy for them to fall over and get out of them. Soft toys for play. Cords, tablecloths, pot handling, we already talked about that, just out of reach so they don't pull anything down on top of them. Um, pick up hard objects on the floor, things they might trip over. And another good thing, even the Academy of Pediatrics recommended when little kids are learning how to walk, they should have shoes on to protect their little feet from jamming them or, or getting hit into um, furniture and things like that when they're learning how to walk. They don't step their toes. 
And I thought that was a good idea for patients, for peop, um, babies that have bleeding disorders. And the other thing that might be recommended, especially for young kids at this age, is wearing high top shoes when they first learn how to walk will protect their ankles from getting twisted and give them also better support when they're learning how to walk. Safety around the house, you want to use stationary activity centers and play pens, no baby walkers, bath rings in the tub. And we talked about don't make sure, make sure your toys aren't big enough for them to use to climb and get out of the playpen. And also we talked about the sturdy weighted push toys and exploration of the house. You want to make sure that you're supervising them when they're getting into everything and going around the house. So these two pictures show you the one on the left is those rolling baby walkers, and they're just not recommended because the kids can fall down the stairs. Some of the older ones were tip hazards and stuff, but I, it's just another way that kids can be mobile around the house and run into things. So it's just recommended that you have them more in the right-hand side picture where they have a stationary activity center so they can't go anywhere. And then this is a, a little kid using a push toy to practice walking, give him some support when he's learning how to walk. As far as being out and about for safety, you know, we already talked about rear-facing car seat until they're two years of age. If they're playing on the playground in your backyard or at the park, you want to have close hands-on supervision at all times. So if they're climbing up ladders or um, going down the slides, you want to make sure you're holding on to them so they don't fall. And also any kind of playground equipment, you want to make sure it's in good condition. And then most of the playgrounds um, should have a soft landing surface, whether it be um, small wood chips or most of them have that foam rubber mat stuff now, which will help prevent any kind of bleeds if they happen to fall when they're running around and playing. And then if you're using swings for kids at this young age, they really should be in those baby swings that wrap all the way around and have a seat because kids at this age don't have the cognitive understanding or the motor control to know that they have to hold on to the, the side chains for the regular adult size swings at this age. With a bike, if, you're if you want to put some kind of attachment on your bike and take them out for a bike ride at this young age, it's not recommended for any kind of seat attachment to a bike for kids under one year of age. And what is recommended is that you use a rear mounted bike trailer for all kids from one to four years old because that's the most safe thing for them. As far as trampolines, which you probably won't have for kids this young, but you might be thinking in the future that's not really recommended for backyard trampolines because there's too many accidents and injuries that occur in backyard trampolines. And as far as bounce houses go, there's a lot of injuries seen at the emergency room, like over 64,000 kids a year come to the ER because of bounce house injuries. And so especially if you're going to be having young, young children under two years of age in a bounce house if you're at a party or something, what they recommend is obviously limit the number of kids. The kids should be the same age and same size. So your little two-year-old shouldn't be in there with their 10-year-old cousins bouncing around because they tend to be a little more wild and that's just going to put a higher risk for injury. So as far as some ideas and tips from our parents, some of this is going to be review because some of them did what we've already recommended, but I just wanted to go over stuff that parents have done with their children during this age time when they were diagnosed with a bleeding disorder. So a lot of them did use padded clothing and knee pads to kind of protect them from getting butt, knee, and elbow bleeds. One mom, because some of the padded clothing wasn't available when her son was young, she went ahead and bought herself a sewing machine and she sewed padding in all of his clothes because he you know, had severe hemophilia and an inhibitor, so he was bleeding all the time. So that's not something you need to do for every case and scenario that was just you know, the most severe um, case for her. So that was what helped her son. Some parents have used a soft helmet for a short time when they're crawling and learning how to walk to prevent them from bumping their heads into some of the furniture. In their stroller, they put extra padding because the seat's padded, but all the plastic little cup holder and the little front part and the side rails are hard plastic or metal, and the kid would like hit their arms and stuff in it, so sometimes they put extra padding. If they had the bouncy seat in the activity center, the front of it, they would lean their tummy on and kind of get bruises on their tummy, so they put a little towel roll or a little padding in the front. Some other ideas, they you know, covered all the corners and counters with foam padding. They even put padding all the way around the dining table, padded all the doorknobs, tub faucet, 
they had hard chairs, so they put cushions on all their hard chairs. One parent even put foam roll padding all around the bottom of their entertainment center because the kid was bumping into that a lot and it was in the family room where they were playing a lot. One of our parents used um, that carpet padding tack when her little baby, you know, he was diagnosed at like 10 months. So in his room where he was playing and had all his toys, she just had her somebody come and tack that carpet padding all around the walls in his bedroom till he got older and then they took it off and just patched and repaired it so that kind of eased her mind of him falling and hitting the walls when he was playing. Um, and then they put extra padding in the crib when they got older so that they didn't, you know, when they were climbing up and playing and stuff when between one and two, they wouldn't hit the side rails of the crib and get bleeds. Some of the parents ended up putting carpeting because they had all tile floors out here in California and her kid, you know, had an inhibitor and it was just like there's no way he can walk around on the tile floor. So they carpeted their whole house. Some people put just carpet in the bedrooms. There's also those foam play mats and now they have even on lots of different websites and at Home Depot and Lowe's and all those other things, you can actually get those connector foam floors and put them in certain areas in your house. Some of the parents have the whole downstairs with them. It can get very pricey, so that's not something you have to do. It's just something that some of the parents decided to do because they didn't want to worry about their kids crawling and getting bleeds and falling on their hard tile floors. And when the kids got older, instead of putting them in a toddler bed, they just went ahead and put their mattress on the floor because you can climb out of the toddler bed anyway, and they just didn't want to worry about them falling out of the bed, climbing in and out of the bed. And then obviously putting gates to keep them in certain areas of the home. Some of the parents even put large couch cushions around the walls or over the slider glass doors when the kids were playing in the playroom. They used those peck and play and play pens to contain them and keep them safe. One of the families even remodeled their kitchen, family room area, so they had a, a little half wall in so they could put a gate in to keep them in the playroom area while mom was in the kitchen and cooking dinner so she could keep her eye on them because that was where the family spent most of their time. And one of the families even only had the immediate family ever pick up and carry the kid because the other people, you know, if they pick your kid up, they're a little rough and bounce him around and he was always getting bruises and bleeds and stuff. Obviously, always supervising them crawling and walking, never left them alone. And then they only used those stand-up push toys and not those seated little propelled toys when they were learning how to walk and play. So I know this is a lot of information. I'm glad this will be up on the website so that you can review it. So I hope that this webinar has helped you understand just kind of some of the normal basic motor skills that kids learn between zero to two years. Some safety ideas, especially at the different ages to allow them to be mobile and safe in your house, and then aware of accidents and injuries that are typical from zero to two years, and then being familiar with some basic physical therapy treatments. So if your child gets a bleed and you come to the hemophilia treatment center, you could talk to your therapist if they're available, if there's anything that they recommend to do for the bleed. And also recognizing safety at your home and when you're out and about in a way to help reduce any injury risks and bleeds. And then also learn some ideas from families to decrease some chance of bleeding. So typically at our center, we will hook up um, our nurse coordinator, anybody that has a baby or a young child that's newly diagnosed with hemophilia. We usually try to hook them up with um, contact some of the other families that have gone through that and are a good support for them so that they can bounce off questions and get some support helping them you know, parent a baby through that age too. So if anybody has any questions at this time, I am more than happy to look at them and see if I can have um All right. Perfect. Great. Thank you. And ladies okay. and gentlemen, to ask a question via the web presentation, select okay. the chat pod located in the lower left corner of your screen, then type and send your question. If you would like to ask a question via um, your telephone, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. I will announce each caller prior to bringing you into the conference. Please remember if you have your phone on mute, take it off mute when you are selected to ask your question. And once again, to ask a question via the web presentation, select the chat pod located in the lower left corner of your screen and then type and send your question. And to ask a question live, press star 1 on your telephone keypad. 
All right, so we have our first question. Uh, this is from Isaiah. He was asking, do you have some photos of the padding or some suggestions where we can purchase the padding? So as far as padding your furniture corners, they have that stuff wherever they sell baby supply stuff. So I don't – there's different baby stores all over the country. But any major store that sells anything for babies, they um, should have foam padding and it just sticks to the edge of your furniture and it shouldn't ruin any of your furniture or if you're going to do like your fireplace. So for furniture padding, if you're just going to do the corners and around that, they have it at all the baby supply stores um, or any other store that you can buy all your baby stuff at. As far as for the floor padding, like if you were going to get the play mats and things, they have play mats at some of the big department stores and stuff that sell baby furniture like out here in California, you know, at Walmart and Target and some other ones like that. You can also get them at the baby stores. They also sell a lot of that foam padding at your major um, home remodeling stores like Lowe's and Home Depot. You can even order it on Amazon and some of those other online um, stores. And if you just type in like foam floor Pat, mat padding. There's tons of different um, manufacturers that make it directly, and that's what they do. And there's lots of different price ranges for it. Um, I didn't put pictures up because I had a hard time finding some that were um, free to use for like webinars and stuff like that that aren't copyrighted. So I just didn't want to put up like a certain one. But you can look at. There's lots of places where you can get the padding for the floors. If you want to get those connected padding at Lowe's, Home Depot, all those Amazon, and then there's lots of different foam mat flooring websites. As far as um, padding around your furniture, I mean in house and stuff, I mean I packaging stores should have like some like bubble wrap stuff that you could put around or even um, carpet stores or furniture uh, stores and stuff like that. If you were just going to like wrap the furniture with padding, you might be able to use like old carpet padding or something like that. I hope that answers your questions. All right. Our next question we have for, from Veronica is, if you have only one floor in your house, can kids use walkers then? Um, I'm just going to say that they are not recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And you can talk to your pediatrician about that. I'm just reporting what is recommended and not recommended. And the one thing with the walkers is they don't really, I mean, it's not something that's shown to promote independent walking, but if you are it's something that you wanted the kids to be in, I would just talk to your pediatrician about that. And if you're at your hemophilia treatment center, you know, your pediatric hematologist is a pediatrician also. So you could just talk to your doctor. But I'm just going by what's not recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics. So I can't really voice opinion on that. I would just talk to your own pediatrician and see what they say. All right, great. Thank you. And it looks like we have no further questions, so I will turn okay. it back to you, Grace, for any final comments. Okay. And then I hope that this um, helps, helps you uh, understand the motor development, but also give you a little more peace of mind that, you know, the kids can be active and learning all their gross motor spill, skills, spills, <laughs> spills and skills in a safe way. And as a physical therapist, we really do encourage the kids to learn all these different things at these ages and to encourage them to learn how to go up and down the stairs and all that because as they get older, it, it helps them develop balance, coordination, strength so that they will have less falls when they get older and get a little faster, especially when they start riding bikes and tricycles and all that stuff, it's really important for them to develop all these motor skills at a young age that will carry over as they get older. Oh, we have one further question that came in from Kelly, and that is on one of your slides um, recommended a harness to help with walking. Where uh -huh. have you seen this? Uh, they, I've seen them on um, Amazon. If you put in like baby walking assist harness, there was really only like two that I saw that were like actually for helping support walking. And so um, one of them was called like 
angel wings or something like that. So if you, no, not angel wings, but if you go on or just talk to your physical therapist at the Hemophilia Treatment Center, and um, it looks like they're in like a little sling, like baby, like you would have a baby carrier that you carry that you attach to you. But it has like straps on the side, and then it has, um, uh, I don't know what you call them, like straps that the, that the parent would hold up above the kid so that you can walk with your kid and you're kind of holding them. Um, it almost looks like you have a, a puppet kind of thing on a string. But it's so that the parent can be more upright and support the kid, and especially if you have a really tall dad and you have a little kid or a tall mother and you have to lean way down when your kid's learning how to walk and hold their hand, it's really bad and uncomfortable for your back. So if you just go and Google um, walking assist harnesses, there was like two that I saw on the website. They, and they sell them on Amazon and stuff like that. They might have them at the baby supply stores also. All right. But they're not the ones that are just like a thing the baby has and then it has a leash on the back. They actually have two straps coming up above the shoulders on the kid and you would be standing like right next to them holding onto them. It's not those ones to keep your kid from running away from you. <laughs> <laughs> no, very great. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, your feedback is critical to us. Let me just get that open. Not only in evaluating this presentation, but also in planning of future webinars and programming. Please complete this five-minute survey appearing on your screen now by clicking on the link. For each webinar in this series that you attend, completing an evaluation will enter you for a chance to win a Fitbit at the end of the series. Attend and evaluate more than one webinar to increase your chances of winning. Thank you everyone for attending, and this will conclude our program. Have a good night.